So YouTube is live now, so um, welcome to the talk. Uh, we'll be starting in two minutes. Please be patient. So YouTube is live now, so um, welcome to the talk. Uh, we'll be starting in two minutes. Please be patient. Hello, my name is Nick Smith. Nick Smith usually introduces these talks, however, he's otherwise engaged at the moment, having recently become the proud father, proud parent of Esther, who came quietly into the world last week. If you're watching live on YouTube, please add any questions to the chat as we go along. We'll try to get those answered at the end. As usual, everybody in the Zoom will be unmuted at the end for applause. So welcome to the eighth in our series of Alpine Clubcasts. This one focuses on the Aiguille des Pellerins. Why has it become the location of so much obsession? Well, in the same way the Eiger's visibility from Grindelwald has made it the scene of so many dramas, so the Aiguille beckon from Chambly. They are alluring, they are a absorbing, they're a little bit dangerous. The north face of the Pellerin is close to the valley and yet lonely and dark and threatening once you're in there. Close up, there's an incredible sense of foreboding. This is steep ground, north facing, icy, and in winter, very icy. In 1975, it took, 1974, I'm sorry, it took the vision of Al Rouse and Rab Carrington to realize its possibilities. They brought Scottish style mixed climbing, uh, mixed climbing techniques to the Alps. The winter has sent to the Rebifar Terre route, ushered in a new era of Alpine climbing. It was so different from the summer climb that the change of name was entirely justified. And the climbing, the ice climbing version of the Rebifar Terre is now quite often, usually in fact, known as the Carrington Rouse. So we are very, very privileged and fortunate to have Rab talking for the first uh, short bit, 10 minutes. Rab has an amazing career, climbing career, hard new routes in Scotland, the Alps, Patagonia, Himalayas, and he now still enjoys relatively high standard trad and sport climbing. 
Some of us have had the privilege of repeating one or two of his climbs. I still get cold sweats when I remember a particularly long run out pitch on his route on the great north face of the Gletscherhorn in the Lauterbrunn Valley. Somehow Rab has managed to pack all of this in with a successful business career and a family life. So here is Rab to talk about 1974. Are you there, Rab? Yeah, Victor. And hello, everybody. This is all a bit weird, I must admit. <laughs> I'm surrounded by technology, which just ties the hell out of me. So if anything goes wrong, blame technology, not me. I'm going to transport you back 45 years. 45 years ago, Al Rouse dreamt up this wonderful idea to have a winter ascent, a whole season, climbing in Chamonix from a fixed base. And so he, uh, he managed to find a very posh apartment in Argentière where Brian Hall, John Whittle, myself and Al would base ourselves to discover the delights of winter climbing. Now, back in 74, December 74, when we first went out there, climbing in, in winter in a kind of alpine style was just unheard of. Various people had been doing stuff. You know, people like Marmier had done the cross, but they'd fixed ropes and had a big expedition. Likewise, de Maison had, had his siege a sense of um, the Grand Jurassic. We were no good at that sort of stuff. So we just said, right, let's go out and do it. Are we gonna, have we got a first slide up there somewhere? Now, one of the problems is, here's Al, um, at a slightly different time, but I don't have very many slides, so you'll have to put up with this one. But the main thing is that the gear was so different. So in, in 74, this is pre-Gortex. Can you imagine that? We had to use ventile and other natural materials. The, the boots that Al's wearing there, they came, you know, we had to manufacture them ourselves. You know, we went into snails and, um, you know, put neoprene gaiters over the top of them, stapled them. We had to make um, our own stoves. And also we had to get about, we only had raquette. So it was a very, very different thing. And we had no idea of how it was all going to work. So our first thing to do was to find out how cold it got. And so we got the Telefreak up to, um, to the Brevon and just dosed out. And lo and behold, we were warm enough. And the stove did work. So we thought, bonus. And the next thing we did, we went to do a very short climb on the Col de Jardinière. And we took two days to do this. A wonderful ascent, we thought. We were very proud of ourselves. Um, two years later, Patrick Valençon skied down it in about 20 minutes. So much for our wonderful heroics. So there we were in our posh apartment, pussyfooting around, when news came to us that two unknowns from Britain had actually done the Cornwall Divide on the Duat, the Rotters. We didn't say that to them. We, we bore it with great distinction, I think. But it meant that Al had to set his mind in motion. Where do we go now to upstage these upstagers? And so he chose, the first route he chose was going to be, be the, um, the Super Kulwa which at that time hadn't been climbed. And so loaded with all our gear, we headed out to that part of Mont Blanc de Taco, um, the gully just to the left of um, the Gerber City Pillar. And we spent the whole morning struggling, trying to free climb into the base of the Super Couloir. And having failed to do that, we decided, well, let's not go there. And the Gervasuti pillar was right beside us. And so we went and climbed the Gervasuti pillar, as you do. So we had a three days of 
wonderful, wonderful climbing. You're all the way up uh, this wonderful piece of rock. And um, you know, as we were going up, the climbing was intricate. It was very, very cold. You know, luckily we had silk gloves so you could strip down to silk gloves and just climb the rock climbing sections on that and crampons. And after three days, we arrived at the summit safely back home and thought, Ooh, not a bad route. And in fact, nowadays I look back on that and think, hmm, in my career, that is one of the best, best routes I've ever done in my life. I'm very proud, proud to have done it. We then went back and in this wonderful apartment that we had, there was um, a very social feeling about it. And we were, there were parties most nights and it was all going on really well. In fact, at one point, the, we had a party in which the whole of the 1975 Everest expedition turned up and all the Hastons and Willens and all those people all turned up and we had a very, very cool time, though the neighbours weren't quite so happy. We bribed them with brandy, I think it was. Anyway, we got into of the weather and eventually Al was wondering, well, what are we going to do now? And he kind of he was on the balcony of the, um, the apartment in Argentia and he says, oh, that looks good over there. I said, oh, all right, let's go and do it. I hadn't even seen what he was looking at, but that, I, I never did. He, made, he said, this is what we're doing. I went. And so the next night we got, we got packed up. We found ourselves at the top of the, call, um, of the Midi Teleferique and... Um, we were in the dark of that night in a, on our racket. We were heading out to do the Pelaran, the north face of the Pelaran. Um, I've since learned that the route that we were doing was the Rebufa Terres. I didn't know at that time. So the, the climbing was better. The, we should have a, another slide, I think. Ah, good man, good man. There you go. Proper modern gear, look at that rucksack. A Taizo tatty sack. Well, it was, I, I had to remake it myself, but it based on it. Um, anyway, we, we set off and as you can see, we had big rucksacks, um, even leading on the, the route. And um, the climbing was absolutely fantastic. Um, we had planned to have a bivy on it, and so you know that was why our rucksacks were so big, and we we carried on and on until the end of the the this ice runnel, which had come down most of the route. And by the end of the first day's climbing, we had got to the the end of the ice at that point. Next slide, please. So we bivied the night and we, we kind of looked, you know, Al and I just, we weren't very good at artificial climbing. And so we tried, there was a little overhang at the start of the, this groove line on the, the Buffar route. We thought, hmm, I don't think we can do this in winter. And so... I then embarked on this rather stupid pitch, which led down from way from where we were traversing on ice, which was about, if it was half an inch thick, you were lucky. And so there was absolutely no protection on it and traversed across and then up and eventually we gained the slope, you know, um, um, the ice, you know, Deirdre, where we could, you know, continue our route and eventually get to the summit. And then from the summit, we descended back down, you know, to the, the in, on our rackets, back down to um, the Midi 
and Chamonix. So at that point, we had a lot more drink and we were quite pleased with the route. However, we never really believed that it would become the iconic route that it seems to have become. Um, you know, but that's life. But I bet not many people do that last pit, that pitch a traversing and up into that other couloir, because that was quite quite hard. Anyway. That's the end for me. I don't know if I've taken 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever, but let's see what time it is. Well, it's 44 or something. Yeah, should be about right. Okay, over to you, Vic. Thank you. Rab, that was uh, brilliant. And it reminds me, of course, that in those days, ice screws had to be put in with an ice axe and had screwed around with a lot of force and effort. It's not like modern ice screws at all. No, Things we pick no, up there. Nor could you afford very many of them. <laughs> that's right, and they and each ice screw weighed a ton as well. Anyway, yes, that was uh, it was a real. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. I hope you can stay on for questions uh, later at the I end. Will, I will do. I, I look forward to hearing from Andy P. Right. <laughs> okay. So in 1992, Mark White and Andy Andy Parkin added um, another iconic route beyond good and evil to this obsessive little corner of our universe. Uh, to put it in context, here are a couple of quotes from the second ascensionists. Francois Marcini says the route is fantastic, almost out of this world. Francois de, Mala de Milano says, with its 14 exceptional pictures over severe mixed terrain, this is the stuff of myth. Beyond good and evil is a byword for committed climbing with mineral protection. Such is the setting of this extraordinary goulotte whose famous dihedral can be seen from all over Chamonix, it fires the imagination. Beyond good and evil is one of those routes that stays etched in your mind throughout your mountaineering career. Well, Andy is exceptionally elusive. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before. But <laughs> I did manage to get this recording of him last week, and here he is in his studio talking about the years of obsession, 1989 to 1992. To the northwest of the Pelerin. It started for me in about 1989, January 1989, way before we even thought of that particular climb, the one that was going to become Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, I soloed the what's called the Northeast Diagonal, Les Chapes in French, which goes up to the Col du Pain, uh, but goes into the basin under the groove. So if you like, I did the lower pictures, which I believe were also done by Nisbet and Bailey as well, as a direct start to the Northeast Diagonal, which going back to Rab and Al, I think they did that as well in one winter, this Northeast Diagonal, right? Um, anyway, so Nisbet and Bailey climbed these lower slabs that get you into the kind of snow field below the big groove uh, beyond. Um, uh, I did this and then did the kind of gnarly climbing in the chimneys of the Northeast Diagonal. And above all, you come out onto an amazing promontory. Like, you projected right out in space. This is before you hit the uh, big diagonal line of snow that takes you to the Col du Pain, where you get off down the other side. I got there, and finally I can look all over the place, right? And above all, what I did see. I'm looking right into the groove of Beyond Good and Evil. I'm going, wow, 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 I can't believe this. Like, it was like looking, like being, like stuck out in fate, in space, like pretend you're a drone looking into the cenotaph corner, something like that, right? And I looked off to the right, and there's all the slabs going away towards the pain. And, and I saw what was later going to become um, Pelerinage, and I'm looking. Because I've just done this, this is getting me back into climbing, what I've just soloed, right? After the accident, like five years afterwards or thereabouts, not even four and a bit, I'm soloing like this again. I've just done a hard solo and I'm looking at the future and I'm thinking, dare I solo that or that? 
Uh, I think it would have gone for Pelerinage, because when me and Christoph Bord one did it, it would have been better to solo it. And there, dilemma. Came down, Mark Twy was around, of course, who would have already teamed up for climbing various things and attempts on the obvious side of the Agri and stuff like that. Um, I'd also noticed the line of beyond. And I was telling him about what I'd just done. And of course, he was a bit critical. Well, you took a bit of time. It took about seven hours on this route. But I'm, I'm limping my way up and everything. Plus, it's hard, you know, uh, harder than it looks. Mm. So I'm a bit miffed with Mark. And saying, then again, I've got something for you. There's this amazing line. He says, you, want, you mean to the left? He says, yeah, have you seen it? He says, yeah, I noticed it from the valley. And this is Mark, the big group, right? But do you think it all links up? He says, well, I've just soloed the bottom pictures, right? Um, whether it links up above that, we'll see, right? All the way to the summit. Uh, okay, let's go. And he might have looked at it, Mark, with uh, Christoph Bordon, who we also climbed a lot with at that time as well, right? We all climbed together, you know. Um, I think he went up to have a look. Um, anyway, Mark's keen to go. So we go on November 1989. We've um, been watching all autumn, the big phone wind thing. That stopped and conditions became what we thought were perfect, as good as you're going to get anyway. This is the first time we've ever seen ice in this line. And I've been looking for years from the very first photos that I've ever been able to see of the whole range. I'm talking from 1840 through to then. So it was a climatic change thing. And in 1989 as well, on the murder glass, I'd just done the murder glass sculpture with all the rubbish we'd found because the snow had receded. This is the beginning of the global warming. That was in September. And um, so here we are, right? The, the beginning of the global warming, creating lines like that already. So, 89, the night we're in the little winter refuge of the Plan de l'Aiguille uh, refuge, listening to rap music. And Mark's going, yeah, fucking God, I'm rap music and everything like that, because he's into kind of more goth stuff, right? And, um, and bang, announcement. The Berlin Wall's just fallen. And we're there in the refuge, we're going, it's, a, it's an omen. And we're both like totally ramped up. Tomorrow we're going to climb our wall, you know? And of course we failed. The first attempt proved that, I mean, Mark took a massive fall out the groove, a whole plate of ice went, you know? And, and it was a bit like being in a rock route, like, a, you know, you bridged across the corner and tentatively placing nuts before you're about to fall off. It was that thin on ice. Um, and um, so we battled up into the groove, but we couldn't get out top out on the groove so we failed taking too long all this stuff really disappointed we, you know, okay we're gonna have to learn a bit of humility calm down go back again so the next time up was probably a year well obviously the year after november and spring because winters were so cold it never formed in winter if it didn't happen in autumn or spring and if the foam winds didn't destroy it in, in autumn then you could only do it in autumn and spring so spring came around again we went up again this time i led the pitch to let out the groove and then we got hammered by a massive storm again. The whole process is still taking a lot longer than we think in terms of climbing, right? We get used to these long pictures, big down jacket for the second, desperate climbing, you know, awkward protection, adequate. Um, falls, we're learning to fall on this route as well. And so it went on and on until April 92, the whole epic of this obsession that my girlfriend said at the time, they should eventually call it the Sacre Graal, the Holy Grail. And Mark also lost his wife and all that as well. Huh? So we sacrificed a lot with this obsession. Girlfriends, wives, um, totally paranoid the whole time that somebody else sees it. And all it turned transpired later that a few climbers did see the line of the groove. No one actually went anywhere near it. From November 89 to April 92, can you imagine? Huh? It's like, as Mark said later, create, uh, for, the complacencies kill the creativity in the Valley of Chamonix. And it's like, there's only me and him climbing, you know, around. Um, and so we managed to somehow keep it secret and keep our own um, motivation alive after all these failures. It was really getting to us. We, can't, we, we, we can climb stuff like this. We've climbed harder than this, but not quite consistently as hard. And, and, and our big problem was getting our heads around the fact that Although it's only the egg, but it's not that massive, you know, um, it's not a, a thousand meter wall. Um, it's still hard and technical. 
and, it, and each pitch was like the unfolding of a new technique, a new something else, right? Uh, and if you look at some of those slides, some of these really dry. There's minimal ice. We never carried ice screws at all on that. There wasn't enough ice. It was more a rock route with a bit of ice on. Um, pitons for belays, occasionally protection, tenuous placements. Uh, I think we even used copper heads, all sorts of stuff. Mostly nuts though, right? Um, like I said, we learned to fall more and more, you know? Um, I fell off the 13th pitch on the final ascent because a, an axe dragged through a load of gravel that had jammed it in a crack, right? And it just ripped and off I went straight onto the belay. I got back to Mark, he says, hey man, don't do that to me, don't do the following director of the belay, says, Mark, you think I do it on purpose? You know, um, and it went on and on like that. And then finally, in the April of 92, said, this time we're gonna do it, because we go up so often, and conditions weren't good. It was like melting out, falling, rocks whizzing down. Eventually, we'd just take up all the gear, rock climbing gear and everything, we were climbing on the west face of Blatia. We actually spent a lot of time up there, bivouacking under the rocks at the bottom. And anyway, so it was kind of hard to keep things motivated. So for, on the final ascent, April 92, we thought we've got excellent conditions now. You know, I mean, it's, it's certainly warmer, so it's more tolerable on the belays. The ice was more that plastic stuff as well, that they didn't fracture and shatter it all, always. Um, plus we knew the route better as well, didn't we? But it, it was still loads of surprises. Each, each time we pushed further, we, we, we discovered more things. Um, pitches could be a two and a half hours long for the leader, you know, alone, you know. Um, so eventually we bivouacked on it to make sure. Because back then we constantly get hit by storms as well. Um, of course we'd check the weather forecast, but we'd still get these little storms, you know, um, uh, massive like spin drift avalanches and things like that. And but you didn't bivouac on the route, you bivouac the bottom of it. No, we bivouac before and on the route finally to make sure we got it. I mean, gone out the groove for, you know, the opening time. Climb the, the interlinking sections that, I remember getting the first lead of that pitch, although we did alternate leads later on subsequent attempts, like a really hard, that Mark on his original topple just goes, ha ha, exclamation mark. Um, I said, how do you do that? And it was like undercut axes, you know, like an upside down pin for protection. And it, Axis up to underneath and you're like leading out, leading out, like going oh, like that and swinging off into around the corner into, you know, you hope you're gonna, you, you don't go all the way. <clears throat> and it went on like that. Anyway, we'd be right there. And like I said, the last pictures were all exciting, you know, and I remember when we got to the top, uh, it was dark, the wind's blowing, it's snowing again. And we just hiked down the other side, a few repels down the other side. <clears throat> And then almost waist deep snow back to the refuge. And that's it. We finished with this room. Thank God we can get on with something else. You know, it was like it occupied us enormously. You know, all those roots of that period were just healing roots for me, by the way, getting over the accident. And it was great to be back in, involved in a project. But this one was a bit different because it went on and on and on. And we kept failing and we kept failing, right? Um, uh, and we were worried that supposing the line doesn't appear again because we didn't quite know that that was the beginning of the warming up of the planet at the time that's going to give birth to that route which as you see these days everybody can do it these days and it's fat with ice like that and everybody uses ice screws and just about anybody can climb it back then I don't know you know because we nearly we nearly, we nearly didn't get it and there were no takers for that route as far as I know in this whole valley you know well, initially when the two Francois repeated it a few years later, right? And Francois Marcini made the good call because he'd wait for good conditions. As he said to me, he says, no point, you know, it's, it's not like a first ascent. You wait for the better conditions on the subsequent ascents, don't you? Makes sense. We were worried about the line never appearing again because we'd never seen it before. You know, we didn't know it's going to get fatter and fatter and fatter for everybody to climb. Otherwise, we could have waited ourselves maybe uh, and climbed it a lot easier and had more fun. Um, um, so they opened the floodgates, if you like, and don't forget, this is all before what we have now in communications. But word got out, and before you know it, people were doing it, and they'd meet people in Chamonix, <coughs> and they'd say, ah, oh, great route, Andy. 
but none of them finished it because the two Francois finished up yes. the Carrington Rouse route. So missing out like three, four pitches to the summit, some of the hardest, you know. So I was always like a bit fed up with this. I said, well, no, nobody's finishing it until much later. Uh, Marco Presselge yeah. and Stephen Koch, Stephen, a guy I did a new route in Patagonia with, by the way, they did it, finished the whole route and freed it. And when I, when I met Marco, I said, that is the only real ascent of the route, you know. I was so happy that those guys done it, finished it, rather than opt out or, you know, do the easy way <clears throat> and clean it up and do it properly, i.e. we're evolving into something else. That was the best ascent of the route for me, yeah. their, their ascent. Uh, right. Uh, wow. Thank you, Andy, uh, remotely, um, if you're watching in Chamonix. Um, anyway, so finally, oh gosh, it leaves me with quite sweaty hands just listening to that. Finally, we arrive in 2020. And just before the advent of COVID, the trio of John Bracey, Matt Helliker, and Pete Whitaker climbed the exceptionally steep line of beyond reason. I asked John what motivated him to complete this line. And he said the missing link in the end was dealing with his lack of self-belief. It was overcome by his very real fear that someone else would steal the line first. Haven't we just heard that from Andy? So the only part of John that is much greater than his ridiculous modesty is his talent for mountaineering. Over to you, John. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thanks for showing up. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this uh, route beyond reason um, and mix in a uh, little insight in my journey, how I got into alpine climbing and the uh, instrumental part played by mentors in that process. Um, I'm just gonna put the slides up now. Okay, so this first slide here is um, a photo of this climber that you just heard mentioned by Andy, Marco Brazel, um, sat beneath the big unclimbed cliff in Albania. Marco, the very devoted Slovenian alpinist, has made a huge contribution to mentoring young Slovenian climbers, as well as inspiring climbers from all over the world. And I'd say in general, the climbing community needs more people like Marco. Okay, so <clears throat> on the left here, you see a list. Um, these are some attributes <clears throat> that I think uh, are really useful if you don't want to be a good alpine climber. So I'm going to attempt to illustrate those um, as I talk through my climb that I did this year with uh, Matt Hallecker and Pete Whitaker. Okay, so inspiration, obviously we all need to get inspired to dream um, and then to make plans to try and turn these dreams into reality. Um, this inspiration for me is much more powerful if you witness something firsthand or if you have a personal connection with you know, other climbs, other people's ideas. Um, a vision, um, to have this imagination to know what's possible for you or other people to kind of delve into the world of unknown. Um, and, uh, you know, as a younger climber, it's very hard to have this vision. Um, so it's very, you know, we often constrain ourselves through our fears and self-doubts. Um, perseverance goes without saying really, doesn't it, that uh, if you don't know, get into alpine climbing. And then you need a perseverance by the bucket load because um, you're going to go home disappointed quite a few times in your alpine career. Okay, um, and then I've got Sixth Sense, Mountain Sense. Uh, for me, it's both a science and an art. Um, there's judging conditions and the weather evolving. When's the right moment to go? Often alpine climbing is about being in the right place at the right time. Um, and then developing your survival instinct, you know, your sixth sense. Um, and knowing that um, even sometimes when conditions are perfect, it might be that your mental game um, isn't there. And that's why you need to turn around. Um, so for me, having mentors can really help um, us learning about these qualities um, and smooth out the potentially bumpy road on the journey to becoming an alpinist. Um, one second. So 
to set the scene, I was born in 1977, two years after Rab Carrington and Al Rouse had made the first winter ascent of the Rob Factor A, and in the same year that Bova and Gabru climbed the Supercore on the Mont Blanc tackle. Um, this is, uh, and then the year after, Nick Colton and Alex McIntyre climbed the central ice line on the north face of the Jurassic. And then in the year that I was born, Alex McIntyre and Tobin Sorensen made the first Alpine style ascent of the Harlan Direct on the Eiger. So some people might say that I was born in an era in the Alps uh, when the Alps were completely climbed out and basically all the best lines in the Himalaya had already been ascended. Um, with ruthless, ruthless obsession, people had risked all to achieve incredible feats. So, you know, for me, the question is, what should the present and future generations focus on? Um, I was very lucky at Leeds University. Uh, we had a very active climbing club and there was a physics teacher who was a former student, Alan Powell, who acted as a mentor for the university club. Um, he inspired us all, gave us this vision and this guy had the perseverance of a bull. Um, for example, uh, for three consecutive Christmas holidays, he would drive out to the Ekrans to try and climb this new route of his uh, on the north face of the Olan. And, uh, you know, no matter what the weather was, he just headed straight to the Olan. And uh, God knows how many bivouacs he had on that face. But uh, him and Kenton Cool were finally successful. And uh, it's a story you should uh, hear about one day. Okay, so my first encounter with the North Face of Pelleran was in January 2000, when this guy Al Powell pretty much dragged me up the Carrington Rouse. And uh, two pictures before the top it was already dark, and my uh, Petzl Zoom head torch gave it the ghost. I kind of wrongly assumed at this point that you know we'd start abseiling back down because it wouldn't be safe to carry on. Al kind of looked at me with disdain and said, kind of, you know, toughen up, lad. You know, we're cracking on. We're not going down until we get to the top. That was a, you know, really influential moment for me in my Alpine climbing career. Um, so it was on uh, that day, actually, that uh, I'd looked across left from the route and uh, I'd seen this spectacular shield of perfect granite um, with some thin cracks going up it. And I guess it was at this point that the sea at first sea was sown um, and giving me the vision of, you know, what would be this climb that I just completed in February with uh, uh, Hugh Whitaker and Matt. Um, so why did it take me 20 years to finally climb it? You know, there's the classic stuff like conditions, weather, time off, having motivated partners, um, bigger stuff, self-belief, gaining confidence from other climbs and other experiences. And what the ultimate kind of kick up the ass was when I heard on the grapevine that another team had unsuccessfully tried a new route on the Pelera. Um, and I was just ravaged by fear that somebody else had envisaged the same line and was gonna steal it. Um, it turns out that they were trying something else that still isn't done. Um, so this is looking, um, these early pictures after we'd left the uh, Rebbe Fat Terrain. Um, uh, I would say that obviously I was the driving force in this climb. It was my idea. Um, and it, I was just so determined that I was going to make it happen um, on this day. Firstly, I had to convince my two partners um, it was a good idea. Um, the previous day, I went up and made a track to the Bergschund. I soloed over the Schund make sure it was all perfect. Um, and unfortunately, the evening before, uh, Matt Hallecker's father thought he was having a heart attack. And so Matt was in this panic that he might have to fly back to the UK. Um, and he was in understandably no mental state to be going climbing, let alone trying a hard new route. Um, so it's kind of amazing that we even started. Um, then, so this is looking up, this is me in yellow. Um, and it is quite an improbable line when you look from below. Um, so the route actually goes pretty much directly above my head in yellow up that big steep wall. Um, a big breakthrough came when my nine-year-old son, Josh, got a telescope from Father Christmas, um, allowing me to see even more detail on the face 
looking from all different angles. Um, and so even though I kind of knew in my head that there was a 90% chance that it could happen, at this point, uh, Pete and Matt were both thought I was completely uh, disillusional, you know, when we were looking to try and do a mixed route up here. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a bit of luck or judgment. And as I say, I was 90% sure, but we found this amazing ramp that took us through this uh, overhanging cliff um, and actually relatively amenable climbing. It was more cerebral maybe than physical at this point. Um, and even though Matt was really stressed out and was kept looking around, looking for anchors that we could have to sail off in case we had to go down, uh, Pete Whitaker, who was very new to alpine climbing, uh, he was completely relaxed. It was amazing. It was like he was just out for summer evenings cragging at Stanage or something. Um, and so that really helped me stay calm and uh, gave me the kind of psychological bandwidth to lead, you know, pretty much all the pictures on the route. Um, so this is looking down near yeah, Matt climbing uh, one of the, I guess, trickier pitches. Um, there's probably nothing harder on this than on uh, Beyond Good and Evil, but there's some pitches that may be a bit more psychological. Um, so now this is probably uh, the crux pitch, uh, physically and psychologically. Um, for me in alpine climbing, it's really essential to know when to push on and try hard. And conversely, when it's not the right day and for a reason that it's to retreat. Um, so it took me quite a long time to lead this pitch. Um, it was extremely run out. And looking up, there was kind of no uh, kind of sense when you're going to get the next gear. Um, so it's probably like a 15 meter run out on like, a, you know, limit climbing for me on site. So kind of M6, M7, um, potential big four. And um, this is where, I guess, for me, you just have to be in the right uh, frame of mind. And uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense always, but um, sometimes you decide that you're going to try your hardest and uh, you'll accept the consequences, whatever they might be. Um, so this pitch here, this was for me a lesson in perseverance. Um, where we'd hoped to go was a completely blank bit of rock. Um, and thankfully out left, we found this uh, really tenuous bit of snow, uh, completely unprotected here for about 25 meters, um, but enabled us to get out to the rep and then finish the climb. So this is us topping out uh, on the climb, which actually goes to the Point Migo, and then we traversed across to Absail back down. Uh, the Carrington Rouse, which is equipped for rappel these days. Um, so this is the three of us um, topping out here. Um, you know, it's amazing the, uh, I guess, fulfillment and satisfaction of doing these climbs uh, passes very quickly. Um, and so like any good addict, the path continues in search of your next fix, your next adventure. Okay, so I'd just like to say thanks very much to Victor for organizing this evening, getting myself, Rab, and Andy together to talk about this uh, amazing corner of the Alps. Okay, over to you, Victor. So I've got to unmute myself. I forgot that. Um, I was so taken by your talk, I completely forgot to unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much. I'll see about uh, getting Father Christmas to get you another telescope so you can feed that obsession. Anyway, that was uh, that was tremendous. Uh, so, audience, as you can see, these routes were climbed by really exceptional people and not just boring climbers. We've got a few minutes for questions now. Um, I don't know if we have any coming over from uh, from Nigel. From uh, not from Nigel, of course, but from uh, from YouTube. And uh, if there's any questions in the room, if people could raise their hand. Um, and if we don't have any questions, that's fine. We just uh, the beer is not very far away. You cannot. Um, is um, there's a, not really a question, Victor, from YouTube, but there's a. I think it's more of a observation. Uh, any of you fortunate enough to have climbed with Andy will know that 
if Andy concedes that a belay is tenuous, it truly is more than tenuous, more a declaration of optimism than a belay. Uh, that, that's it from uh, YouTube at the moment. Right. Um, well, I don't know what... I've climbed with Andy, <laughs> yep, you, John. I've never tied on with Andy Parkin. Yeah. Rab? You have to unmute yourself, Rab. Technology of God. <laughs> so that was from Dave Morgan, if uh, I, I didn't say the name of that. No, I, from Dave Morgan, no. I've never climbed um, on ice with Andy. Um, it's bad enough having to climb with him, you know, on single pitch routes in Derbyshire with him. But I'm sure he's perfectly safe. <laughs> well, and, and who of us can ever, you know, be fully confident in what their belays have been like. I know for a fact mine haven't. <laughs> Very good. Um, my memory, my, my main memory of climbing with Andy is running out of food and he's a real survivalist. I remember one time um, we were coming back after being out for many days and we'd run out of food and we couldn't find the one, we'd hidden a little can of, um, of pate under a stone and we couldn't find it on the way back. And he, it was one of those very, very dry winters in Langtang, and he started cutting grass to boil it. And I, the, the look on his face of disappointment when I found the can of pate, you know, he was just so looking forward to just boiling grass. <laughs> anyway, so any, um, is, that, is, that, is that it from, uh, from, from you to, ah, yes. I have a question for Rab. Um, obviously, uh, I don't know whether it's soon after this winter, Rab, that you kind of uh, got out of mountaineering slowly. Uh, was that because obviously you're more involved in your business um, or did motivation wane? You know, was is it just a natural thing that you were busy with business and family? Yeah, well, I, that was, you know, we, we in the seventies, you're kind of, Getting to this that winter 74, 75, um, you know, that was kind of part way through um, a fantastic decade of alpine climbing, we, mainly with me and Al. Brian Hall was involved a lot of it as well. And so, you know, we, we had done you know, various things. You know, Al was a great planner. He wanted to do the next best thing always. And so after the wind, Alps in winter, we had a pretty good season in the summer Alps that year. And then we were starting to plan for going to South America again. And that bearing in mind was um, an eight month trip. We had to save up a bit of cash for that. Um, that, you know, we did that trip. So we climbed in Patagonia, went to the Piney, Bolivia, Peru did a load of very yeah we talk about Andy Andy uh, Parkins uh, Perkins um, belays I think there weren't many belays in Peru that's for sure um, and then of course we went to the Himalayas and um, you know, did that less than safe route on the Janu and. Um, you know, and by this stage, you know, I had I then kind of fell out with Al for various reasons, and you know, really we didn't climb after um, 1979. 79 was the last climb together, and um, you know, I had other things to do, and so I, I had one more trip. I went to the the proper ridge of Latok, North Ridge of Latok, which is still unclimbed. I would just like to point out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, I really enjoyed watching Danini's just put together a, something on YouTube showing that near ascent they had, um, what, in about 78, was it? Their, their attempt? Phenomenal, phenomenal. And then, you know, that was it. I'd had enough. 
you can only have so much bravery unless you're Mick Fowler. Hmm. Thanks. Victor, there's a question from Richard Pelly, and there's a, a further comment from Dave Morgan uh, on YouTube just saying it's no criticism of Andy, he is a master. So, uh, yeah. What's, his, what's Dave's uh, question? Uh, what's Pelly's question? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Th thanks, Victor. Can you hear me? Yeah. The mention of food prompts me to ask a question to Rab. When climbing three days with Al, did you have anything more than a Mars bar to eat each day? <laughs> ah. Well, um, you've got to remember the relationship between me and Al you know, was quite, you know, we each had our own skills. Al was inspirational. I was the quartermaster. And so, yes, we did. But I was also the, the, you know, the, the, prop, the cook, the man. He was never allowed in charge of the stove. But, but I must admit that, that did come back to haunt me when I was on, um, did a winter ascent of the Tournier Spur a few years after with Al, um, where we had brewed up at the, the Midi, come down to, you know, and started, you know, started the climb. We'd half a cylinder, it was one of those blue, it was a tower cooker with um, your know, blue A cylinders. And um, halfway through, we got about, you know, kind of a pint of water or something and made a brew and um, then started cooking and with all this wonderful freeze dried fruit with strawberries, we had, we had curries and everything with us. It was the first time we'd ever got really organized like that. The gas cylinder ran out. So I thought, all right. So take, took the cylinder off, threw it off the mountain as you did in those days. Next one in, as soon as I put, started putting it in, and all the gas escaped. <laughs> what bastard. What have I done wrong? Have to be more careful. So I made one more cylinder. And I then you know, put it in really carefully, screwed it up. And once again, all the gas escaped. And... I, sudden, I then realized that what had happened was the rubber grommet that made the seal in the blue A stove had frozen to the cylinder, that I'd, first one that I'd thrown down the mountain, so we didn't have a rubber grommet. So we had to do the rest of the climb on boiled sweets and um, ice picked off the rocks, and that was it. It wasn't very good. However... In Al's defense, no, it was my fault, wasn't it? I forgot. I'd always blamed Al for that, but it wasn't. But anyway, when, when we were coming coming down the other side, Al's girlfriend, um, Gwendolyn, turned up with two bottles of pop and two grand jambon. And so they took our rucksacks, skied down the Valley Blanche, and we walked nonchalantly along, munching away on our sandwiches. <laughs> Marvellous. Lovely. Thank you. Right. Is that it? Is that we Nigel, is that it for questions? Um that is That's amazing. Oh wait, um uh, Nick uh Chi uh just says uh great talk, curious. Andy suggested changes in climate change has made ice conditions more favorable on beyond good and evil. Is that applicable to other routes in Chamonix? A new possibility is opening up. Who wants to answer? Oh, John, that's for you. You have to unmute yourself. And I know that, Rab, you've made a similar comment uh, in the past to uh, Andy Kirkpatrick. You told him that um, things have got easier because they got warmer. <laughs> Um, okay, conditions in the Alps, uh, I guess, they've n never ever been so unreliable as they are now. Um, in general, I think you have to be a real opportunist. Um, I'm not sure I completely agree with Andy Parkin in his um, kind of conclusion that global warming has made the beyond good and evil come into condition way more often. Um, 
I would say that, uh, you know, on average, if you look at the last 20 years, Beyond Good and Evil has come into good condition maybe, I don't know, half a dozen times. Um, but, um, you know, it comes into condition quickly and sometimes it might go very quickly. Like in spring now, you know, some routes might have been possible 10 days ago for like a four or five day period. And now they're gone, completely gone. Um, so yeah, we very much have to be an opportunist, particularly for the big North faces now, North face, the Grand Jurassic, you know, we've not had good conditions since 2014, maybe now, 15. Um, so yeah, it was much better back in the day, I promise. <laughs> Rab had it easy, and you, Victor. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Rab thinks that um, you guys have it easy now. <laughs> no, no, I don't. No, yeah, that's very unfair. I, you know that there are lot, things are being done a lot harder. You, you know, equipment has improved dramatically, and that is, you know, that's great. But all that does is allow you to do harder and harder climbs. And, you know, I'm sure that you know, the, the men, you know, most of these things are mental issues, trying to get up a lot of these climbs. And I'm sure the mental difficulties that we had doing things in the 70s would, you know, uh, is, is equal to the mental efforts Andy had in the 80s and John had just recently. You know, but it's you know, 90% in your head. Yeah. Good. Uh, Victor, that's it from YouTube. But if anyone has any questions in the Zoom meeting, if you want to raise your hand, um, if you go to participants and um, find yourself and raise your hand. And Is that it? Is that um, well? In in that case, um, we'll um, we'll close down the the question part oh, of it. Wait, uh, there's a question. Oh, we have another. Uh, question. Rosalind. Yes, no. the one first. Um, can you hear me? Oh yes, I just wondered. You know, to really anybody who's been speaking at all excellent talks. How do you look at a route and, you know, decide whether to try it or not? Is it just that it looks challenging, looks interesting, or are you looking for technicalities uh, or if it hasn't been done before or, or something more? Rab, uh, John, you have to unmute yourselves. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, it was easy for me because I just let Al decide. I no, I never had any say in anything. So there's, uh, there's there's rock roots that I've got my name as first ascent of, and I was just said you know they just said claim that, and I said oh all right then. I didn't know what it was, and then they named it. So that's it. Nothing to do with me. John. Thank you. Um, so personally, yeah, I'm very much motivated to try and make first ascents. Obviously, I've lived in the Alps a long time and repeated a lot of routes. So a big challenge now is to try and find uh, new climbs, which is, you know, very difficult in, in this era. Um, and judging conditions is just a lot of time watching with binoculars and analyzing what freezing levels are doing, when it's raining, when it's snowing. Um, there's a lot of kind of background uh, uh, observations there. And then you never know. Uh, obviously, a big, I guess, appeal of doing first ascents is this uncertainty. Is it possible? You don't know till you try. Uh, once somebody else has climbed a route and you're doing a second ascent or another ascent, then, you know, mentally, um, the challenge has been broken because you know it's possible, you know, to do. And so I guess, yeah, it's the draw of this uncertainty. And unknown. Thank you. Uh, we, we have a question from Simon Richardson. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Hi, guys. Hi, Victor. Thanks, guys, for a great set of talks. Very inspiring. Um, question for John, really. Um, 
So congratulations on Beyond Reason. That looked at an amazing line. Um, very Scottish in nature. Um, I, I was intrigued that you uh, mentioned sort of M6, M7 is about the, uh, the on-site maximum, um, which probably translates to kind of what the on-site maximum actually is in Scotland, apart from um, a handful of routes. Um, I just like your comment on that, John, given that the sort of M grade goes up to M15 or something. Um, how is it there's such a discrepancy between what people can climb technically and actually what happens on the front end on, a, on an Alpine route? Uh, well, that's my probably personal limit um, in the mountains. And that I guess part of this is that uh, this M grade has been adopted in the mountains. And it doesn't make any sense at all, because um, unlike the Scottish grading system, it doesn't allow an interpretation of how exposed and how dangerous the climb might be in terms of the protection. Um, it's purely, a, you know, like a sports climbing area grade, if you want to look at it like that. Um, and so, yeah, for me personally, about M8 is the limit that I've done on site in the mountains without falling off. Um, obviously, it's hard to find really overhanging ground. Um, and yeah, I guess so. Uh, we just get scared. So, I mean, knowing uh, Jeff Mercier, who's opened up a lot of routes in the Alps, he, you know, this guy climbs M13 for breakfast at a, at a bolted crag. And yeah, in the mountains, you know, his hardest routes, which I've repeated pretty much all of them, you know, are probably around M7, M8 in difficulty. I guess we just need to open our eyes a bit more and find even more challenging terrain. But, you know, on-site climbing um, at your limit with, uh, you know, big fall potential is um, a game that not many people are into. Um, and I guess it's nice to have a little bit of margin. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the point, really, isn't it? Because, I mean, again, you know, what, what you're describing there is doing stuff, you know, on-site, ground up. I guess that's the epic here in Scotland. Um, so, uh, and of course, if you're climbing like that, it's a harsh reality check compared to something that has been pre-prepared. Well, um, Simon, you, you've done, you've done your bit of damage in the Alps as well. So you should know the answer to all these questions. <laughs> I, was, I was just intrigued. I, I thought John, John was remarkably honest with, cause, cause that pitch looked hard. Yeah. And I could see it wasn't wasn't steep, but it looked very very bold, and you could see how to do it from the photo. But it looked it looked you know really run out, and I could see it was a very very necky, you know delicate difficult piece of climbing. And it's funny you read lots of accounts, and you know people seem to be climbing sort of M seven M eight pitches, you know um, to a penny, and accounts often Himalayan accounts and other accounts in the in the greater range. And you just wonder actually. Are they really that hard? Are they really doing this stuff on site? Or is it just um, everything gets a bit exaggerated in the, uh, in the heat of the moment? I, I, I just wonder. I thought John was just extraordinarily honest in his account. I think it's really nice. It's a really interesting and insightful question as well, actually. So, um, I think it's very hard to judge a grade, you know, in extremis, you know, in that, particularly if we talk about the Himalayas and the altitude, our brains aren't functioning normally. Um, and so, yeah, I think my honest opinion is often grades get, do get uh, inflated quite a bit. Except on the routes that we've done. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, another Michael, question, Victor. Yeah? Uh, from uh, Adrian. Uh, hi, it's actually from Stuart, but there's a question for Rab, if I may. Um, Rob, you mentioned being creative at snells and stapling gaiters to boots, which uh, sounds very much like the boots we were today. Um, were there other moments of creativity there, equipment-wise, that winter that, that went on to be uh, adopted by yourselves between yourself and Al? Um, the, we, we did have to be very, you know, kind of um, inventive in how we did this because the gear just wasn't available that, you know, that we see today. Um, and basically, as I say, the, 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 those, 
skaters that we put on um, the boots at that period um, were, ta- you know, Berghaus took that and made their Yeti gator out of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you know, our, all the stoves of that time as well, they were all mashed together, bits of people, uh, different stoves to try and get something that, you know, you could hang up and um, and produce like that. And, you know, it was, it was, it was quite intriguing just trying to look at the gear that you had at that time and try and develop it to suit your need of a, you know, kind of adjust it to make it work for you rather than just what the manufacturer might have thought it was being used for. So, yes, and, you know, you know, gear, you know, kind of the ice axes, you know, and when, when I think back on ice axes, you know, the first ice axe I had was a, a straight, you know, picked ice axe, which I bought in the 60s. And then in the early 70s, we started getting, you know, rumours from Johnny Cunningham about, you know, dropped you know, drop picked axes. And I remember being at Glenmore Lodge at that time and actually, you know, bending my axe. Um, you know, there, there was a kind of a procedure to do it, whereby you got you got your two prim- you got two primer stoves going as fast as they could. You <laughs> dropped the legs, you know, so that they tilted into each other. Then you had to heat your ice axe, pick it up to it was it had to be cherry red. Johnny Cunningham told us this, <laughs> and you did. And then you bent it in the vice, kept doing this to it was the right angle. Then you had to douse it in oil, and then take it out. And that was, you know, that's what we did. And it was, you know, and that was, it worked until Schoenard copied, um, you know, Johnny's ideas about drop gear, your drop pick gear. So yeah. that's where it starts. Yeah, a, a fascinating year, I think, because um, I remember reading Al's memorial book as a youngster, um, after school in my local library, and that that kind of inspired me to get into mountaineering. To be honest, so it's an era that I've always been fascinated in. So, yeah, thanks, Rob. Okay, thank you. All right, Nigel, how are you doing? Okay, that's um, so. So we um, can we unmute everybody so to um, give a round of. Uh, <laughs> Quite Hello. Thank you very much. That was really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so, Hello. Nick. Hey. Congratulations, hey. Nick. <laughs> do, do hang around for afterwards, but I'm just going to announce what we have next week before, uh, before we just o- uh, turn it over to an open chat. So next week we've got um, we're marking the 61st anniversary of the first ascent of the. He muted everyone. You need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Victor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think everyone's okay, muted. Okay, so all right. <laughs> okay, awesome. Next week. Next week, we've got, um, oh, we're marking the 65th anniversary of the first ascent of the third highest mountain in the world, Kanchenjunga. And we're really privileged because we've got um, Galinda Kaltenbrunner, who's the first woman to climb all the 8,000 meter peaks without supplementary oxygen. And she's going to talk about quite a harrowing ascent she had of Kanch in 2006 by the Southwest Ridge. We also have got Stephen Jackson, who led the second British ascent of the Southwest Face in 2000, which was the line of the original ascent. Uh, Mick uh, Conefry talks uh, about his new book on the subject. And Leo Dickinson has got some unseen footage of Joe Brown describing the final stages of the first ascent. Uh, There's a little fissure brown at the top. So... um, 
do have a look at the Alpine Club uh, Library YouTube page. And there you can share and watch all the previous uh, Alpine Clubcasts. Uh, also, please don't forget to like and subscribe and spread the word. Uh, we will leave the Zoom door open if you want to stay around for a bit of informal chat after this. Uh, meanwhile, thanks uh, to everybody for joining us, uh, especially to uh, Brab and, and John and um, Andy for his um, contribution. Uh, stay active, stay belayed, stay safe, and good night from the Alpine Club. And everybody can be unmuted. Unmute everybody. Who's left? Unmute. Oh, so I, I will, everybody now has the option to unmute themselves. Unmute. But um, we will be, um, you know, sort of as you I'm, please keep yourself I'm leaving. I want to say something. Big <laughs> I'm leaving now. See you all. Thank you very much. Right, Brad, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a real privilege for us. Thank you. No problem. Bye. Let's, Rab, let's Bye. just say congratulations to Nick and his little one there. Well done. Good to see you, yes. Nick. Hi, Esther. <laughs>